Well, good morning, Southern Oregon. Alice Lima here with Pete Bell Castro. We're here to talk about real estate here in Southern Oregon. We're both brokers at John L. Scott, and uh, welcome to the radio show. So, Pete, uh, you're uh, got a lot going on this week. A lot of things are changing in the market. Why don't you bring us up to speed? Well, gosh, Alice, you know, what are we? We're almost to mid August here. So, summer is like, you believe summer is like half over. <laughs> as crazy as that, crazy as that sounds. Anyway, I think what we're seeing in the last, you know, the last four weeks, Alice, we've seen a really a market that's kind of going up and down. You know, each week seems to be a little bit different. For example, this week uh, in Jackson County, we had 76 closed listings. Last week, we had 58. The week before, we had 93. The week before that, we had 47. You see how it's going up and down like that? Yeah, yeah. Same thing, same thing in pending sales. We go, uh, let's see. Uh, it was 76 in Jackson County. This week there was 100, I think 103 the week before. So we're going up and down. It's across all three counties in Southern Oregon, Jackson, Josephine, Klamath. There's uh, one week seems to be better than the others, but overall there's still a lot of demand, Alice. And as you know, the inventory is still not keeping up. And uh, that may turn out to be, as we look back on the COVID months, going to turn out to be the uh, maybe the biggest thing of all there because there's simply – uh, a low inventory for a huge demand, especially with interest rates even now below. Can you believe this? Below 2.75. Who ever thought that? I, I know, I know. And then the Federal Reserve Bank um, makes these decisions uh, on behalf of our country, and then the rest of us just kind of have to react to it. So um, it's creating a lot of demand in the market, but it's also creating some um, difficult situations with people who are trying to move and they don't have a place to go. Mm -hmm. And it also, I want to also want to emphasize, look, it's also creating tremendous opportunities for some people. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of the good thing that's coming out of this. Uh, try, I tell you, Alice, I've talked to people who own short-term vacation rentals. They're booking them up because there's no football in the fall. There's no school in the fall. These things are booking up all through the fall, the next four or five months. Try to rent one on the coast. Try to rent one. There are not very many because of that. So the whole thing is just kind of upside down. But yet here we go, mid-August, halfway through summer, and it's still uh, an amazing market. We can still say, Alice, in all honesty to everybody, it's an amazing time to buy because of interest rates. And it's an amazing time to sell because of the low inventory. That's just the dynamic that is really feeding our market. Yep. And today we're really excited to be talking with Megan Montgomery. She's agricultural research conservationist and she's going to bring us up to speed on what's going on in uh, her agency because they're dealing with the corona too and it all affects real estate here in southern oregon so do not touch that dial we'll be back here talking to megan montgomery pete and i will have a lot more to discuss a uh, very lively conversation today so don't touch that dial we'll be right back Well, welcome back to the Real Estate Show, folks. I'm Alice Lima here with Pete Bell Castro. We're both brokers at John L. Scott Southern Oregon. And uh, we're here talking today to Megan Montgomery. She's an agricultural resource conservationist. Um, we're going to talk about hemp, one of our favorite, favorite conversations in water and soil. Welcome, Megan. Welcome to the Real Estate Show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your agency and what you do? Yeah, so I'm with the Jackson Soil and Water Conservation District, and we are a public agency. We're a county level agency, um, and we are actually funded by your property tax dollars in part um, that allows us to support property owners across the county, regardless of um, of their location and within or without with it inside or outside of city boundaries um, to solve some of their natural resource management concerns, property management concerns. Um, and we are a non-regulatory agency, so we only work with landowners on a voluntary basis. And we try to find solutions that both meet their goals and concerns and solve landowners' problems, while at the same time uh, benefiting natural resources in our, really in the road. Super cool, super cool. And I bet a lot of people don't even know about your agency and your resource. 
Yeah, maybe not. Um, we do have some outreach capacity here, have a couple people on staff that um, that work on that. You might see our name dropped in newspaper articles as we work on, um, we work a lot on large scale irrigation projects, especially out in the Eagle Point area and the Little Butte Creek watershed, um, all focused on benefiting water quality and supporting better fish habitat. So for all of you anglers looking to, uh, looking to move <laughs> here and purchase property, um, you can in part thank us for helping to improve the watershed for fish passage and fish populations. That's awesome. And you know, we do have people who move here just for the fishing. They'll move all the way across the country. <laughs> Um, and I wish I had a copy here on hand that I could like hold up for the camera, but we have an amazing resource for new property uh, owners that is our natural resource stewardship manual and it is free and it covers every single topic about natural resources that you would have questions about as a new landowner um, and is really like a one stop document for for figuring out whatever problem or starting to tackle whatever problem it is that you are encountering on a new piece of property as you learn that property that's great maybe we should get a copy of that and we can send it out to people yeah i believe that susan has susan ledoux has a stack of them but i would have be happy to um get a bunch of them over to your office as well that's great. That's great. Uh, well, Pete, I know this is one of your favorite um, agencies and you talk about it uh, quite frequently. Um, we've got some hemp questions and some water questions. Where would you like to start? Well, no, I mean, you got to go back to the reason this thing is even going the way it is, is that soil and water are really important issues in our county. Uh, clean water, we've got soil, we've got farmers, we've got 40, we've got people moving in here every month in rural communities, small woodlands and farms and things like that. And where do they turn to for any kind of support or help? Because let's face it, if you don't know what you're doing and there's lots of new rules that are out there regarding these properties, boy, you want to know how to handle them. And I think really people, the buyers of these properties really want to do the right thing. And this is where really the JSWCD comes in so handy and being able to help with that. But let's face it, I mean, I think, don't you, Alice, the biggest issue that we face in terms of land and water in the last four years since the legalization of cannabis in 2016 has been how do we treat our lands here? How are we treating them? What are we doing with them? How are we handling water when we're in a drought year? You know, they're gonna cut off irrigation water September the 1st. That's, that's about two and a half weeks away. So we got lots of issues with water here and how we're doing our lands and things and hemp and cannabis and contributed mightily to the changes that we're seeing, uh, you know, right? Yeah, well, and Megan, maybe you can talk a little bit about hemp and water and water rights and how that is all affecting the land here in Southern Oregon. Yeah, so that's actually kind of a complex and contra very controversial question, um, as water rights are really anywhere in the West, especially, um, especially now with kind of more unpredictable precipitation uh, patterns than what we're used to seeing in the past. So like Pete mentioned, um, you know, we're looking at a much shorter irrigation se season. So not only is water getting shut off um, earlier in the season, but irrigators didn't get their water until later in the season this year. Um, and that impacts really no matter, no matter the crop that you're looking to grow, if you have a water right on your property and you receive water from either an irrigation district or you have a state water right, um, the way that you're able to use that water um, is really important for you to know. So in terms of growing hemp, um, if you're looking to purchase a property that maybe has the previous landowner or a lessee already established a hemp grow there, a hemp field, um, and you want to continue that, um, understanding the what are called points of use and points of diversion on your water right, um, the amount of water that you're able to use and where on the property you're able to use it is really, it's your responsibility as a landowner um, to know what that right is and to stay within that right. So just because you have a water right in general on your property um, doesn't mean that you can use it whenever and wherever on that property that you want to, so. That's very interesting. Okay, you guys, but the problem with that is that nobody, there's nobody who can tell that landowner exactly what it is, exactly what you just said, Megan. I mean, people come in there, Oh, I want to use anything. Can I use everything that I want? I got, I got a pipe into this thing. I can do this. The problem is that nobody's out there telling these people 
what they can do, what their particular right is on their particular land, because these things, these documents that are written are so, yeah. it doesn't make any sense to me. I can't. There actually is a phenomenal resource that we uh, draw on on almost a daily basis and we refer property owners to regularly as well. And that is the Jackson County Water Master. Um, and there might be, I think there's a, a water master for Josephine and Klamath counties as well. Um, but in Jackson County, at least, the water master's name is Siobhan Haynes. Um, and I don't have his card right in front of me, but can find his contact information on the Oregon Water Resource Department website. Um, and they have all of the records of any documented water right um, and can tell you kind of what the current rights are. Um, and then they can also do a little bit of digging into looking at what the historic rights might have been on the property because the way water rights work um, is that in, in fact, <laughs> but not always in practice, in fact, um, if you don't use your water right at least once in any given five year period, you five could years. lose that, that right. Um, but that's not necessarily how it always happens. And you could, if you have evidence that there was a water right on a piece of property before, you can get that again. So what that matters for potentially hemp or rehabilitate, rehabilitating a property that was in hemp um, oh. is doing some research about what the historic water rights might have been. Okay, but there's two um, kinds of okay, you going to, there's two different kinds of rights here we're talking about. Some people have water rights that come out of TID, MID, Grand Pass Irrigation District. They get the water delivered to them. There's right. another that comes out of streams. I'm seeing more and more of those around as I'm traveling around showing property where the rights come from streams. There's mm -hmm. a big difference of what you can take, what you can't take, and all these things that, that proclaim of this thing. And, you know, we don't want to have water wars here. And I'm, I'm just afraid that, boy, unless, I don't know, unless we get somewhere where we're, we're having to share this more, I'm just concerned that uh, people are taking water that they should not be taking. And uh, yeah, it's possible, and that's why, as a as a new landowner, um, doing your due due diligence, that is like Pete said, there isn't someone that's going to come to you and explain this document when you buy your property. It's your responsibility as a landowner to understand the water rights, and you can do that by contacting an irrigation district if you're within an irrigation district boundary. Um, feel free to give us a call to figure out if you are or not. We have uh, great maps here that we can just like look up your address and tell you um, or contact the water master to see what your state water rights are. So are you saying, Megan, that someone can call up and give the address uh, of the property and you can get a, yep. a, an answer that quickly? Yep, we can give you a basic answer that quickly. Um, if it's a more complex question, if we don't immediately find evidence of a water right, um, it'll take a little bit more digging um, and kind of the, the point of last determination about water rights. If you think you have some evidence of a historic right of some sort, but it's not clear in the documentation or something like that, would be to hire a certified water rights examiner and we can help you uh, locate one of those. Have you, ever sold any, have you ever sold any water rights, Alice? Uh, no. You ever sold I mean, any? Just, just sold the rights themselves. Right, you were done there. Uh, no, I've had one. I had one transaction where they sold a half acre to a neighbor um, as part of the overall negotiation, and right. that was against my advice. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I'll just use a, a a quick. This is an opportunity to just explain to new property owners something that they might not know about. Um, which is that you can, if you want to retain the water right to your property and the value of that to your property, because that's a huge piece yep. of property values in the West, in this county or in these counties is what your water right is. Um, but you don't have the capacity, say, as a landowner to grow hemp, to put in a permanent pasture, to have a vineyard, to whatever it is to make beneficial use of that water. You can actually lease it in stream. Um, and so you would do that by contacting Trout Unlimited. They're a, a, like a fish population, fish passage, river health right. organization. Um, and they will actually pay you to leave your water in stream in a way that's considered a beneficial use and you can retain your water right that way. So- and, and who is that? Trout's what? Trout Unlimited is who primarily does that. There's some other organizations that can um, figure out funding basically to do that, um, but that is how we we really would like to do to be that water 
that water right does not go back to the property though alice if you sell that that water right stays with that and so it doesn't you can't just take that water right and put it back onto the farm so when you do that that's right. the problem you're also, saying that's per that's a permanent it's not a permanent lease there's a i don't know what the term the length of time is but it's not a it's not in perpetuity so you're not giving up that water there okay okay all right well that's good to yeah. know because i didn't know yeah. that but when I first became a broker, you could buy an acre of water rights of the Talon Irrigation District for five hundred dollars an acre. You know what they're going for today? Can you even get it? Fifteen thousand dollars if you can find one. And that's a the the leasing a water right. I'll clarify too is a little bit more complicated whether you're within the irrig irrigation district or if you have a separate kind of private or state water right. Because um, an irrigation district is ultimately they're given right in water right uh, on a larger scale and then they are the ones that kind of weed it out to individual customers. Um, so that's not something that you can necessarily work out if you are within an irrigation district. Um, and then one more quick point on um, buying a piece of property just because we're running out of time on this topic. Um, that if you are within an irrigation district and you don't have a water right right now doesn't mean that you can't get water in the future and so what you would need to do is contact one of those irrigation districts whichever one you're within um, and basically get on a waiting list and so as properties are sold and potentially subdivided people don't intend to irrigate in certain given years and they might be might not be using their water rights anymore and so some amount of water kind of comes back on the market within those districts that they can redistribute out to new customers. So. You can be on wait list, and that's a really hard thing to do. But yes, you can do it. Yeah. But boy, the chances yeah. of that you may you may be growing yeah. old by the time that ever. <laughs> yeah, it really depends on your your plans for the property, the length of time you intend to be there, um, and really what your goals are. But we're working with ranchers in the valley that are in the process of getting getting water from being on that waiting list and are. Yeah now able to put in pasture and other things. So. Well, it's a very exciting topic. Do not touch that dial. We've got more interesting conversation with uh, Megan Montgomery, agricultural resource conservationist, and Pete Bell Castro. We're talking about water rights in Southern Oregon. Do not touch that dial. Well, welcome back to the Real Estate Show, folks. Alice Lima, Pete Belcaster here. We're both brokers at John L. Scott in Southern Oregon, and we have such an exciting topic today. We're talking with uh, Megan Montgomery, Agricultural Resource Conservationist, uh, Jackson Soil and Water, and we're talking about water rights. We're talking about hemp. We're talking about cannabis. We're talking about cows and buying real estate, and it's a very exciting topic. Megan, we're so happy you're here. Um, before the break, we were just talking about water rights and how you can lose them if you don't use them so how does the how do they lose them like what is the actual mechanics of you take you your water rights away how does that work so, oh go ahead pete but you don't use them alice if you don't you don't use them for five years you can lose them it's just you don't use it right um yeah basically if you don't if you don't put that water to use on your property watering um usually in a productive kind of way. Um, so diverting the water or that could be irrigating a pasture, it could be irrigating a large garden, it could be irrigating a hemp farm. Um, all of those things are not doing that within a, a given five year period um, could cause you to lose the water right. Um, and as I started to mention earlier, that's not necessarily a hard and fast rule. Um, if you have evidence that there was water used in the past on your property, you can petition um, Oregon Water Resource Department to get that right back. Um, because it was a historic right that went along with the property and you have intentions to put it to use, um, there is a process to do that. It's not set in stone that you will get it back, um, but it's definitely a possibility. So. Well, very complicated scenario. <laughs> So when people are looking to purchase property and they think they have water rights and then they find out they don't, this petition, pro how long does the petition process take? I think it depends on the watershed that you are in. Um, I'm, I'm in Jackson County, so I'm really only familiar with the primary watersheds really in our county um, and how like overdrawn or basically like of, what, of the volume of water that's available in that watershed, how much is already 
being delivered to irrigators, to customers, and how much they're responsible for leaving in stream for, um, for watershed health, for fish passage, for uh, water quality and things like that. So um, it's a little bit dependent upon which watershed you're in um, and how recently that water right kind of was expired, so to speak, or um, wasn't used. So um, I've heard, I've heard a couple of years being the process, um, one to two years, but if it's something that is contributing that much to your property value, I think that it's worth going through the process and trying to figure out um, if for no other reason than your resale value can change. Right. Right. Or your ability to generate a profit agriculturally off that land, because it's hard to do anything um, without water. Okay, there's also a real problem, Alice, is that the, the, the lands that she's talking about, they have to be contiguous. You can't be somewhere else and say you want some water rights and they're not contiguous to where the district is. You can't get the water to it. So right. it sounds easy. What you're saying, Megan, I understand that, but it's a very difficult thing to do. If you're if you're not contiguous, I tried this with a, with a client once before. The land has to be contiguous to a district and even to get to apply for the water before you can even do it. I want to change subject to wells real quick. Alice, you, you deal, you know, we deal with wells an awful lot and some people think they can go take a well and I got five gallons a minute. I can go irrigate all I want with my well. You cannot do that. No, you know, yeah, people don't understand. Yeah. Right? So this basin um, is much different than really anywhere else in the state and most other places in the West um, because our groundwater, which is what a well is drawing from, is not separate from the surface water. So most wells are considered uh, part of surface water. So when you pump out of a well, you're not drawing out of an aquifer that's that separate pool basically of water. It's all one big pool. So it's a lot more difficult to get permits for a new well to drill a well deeper um, and wells are, are subject also to influences of drought in a closer time scale here in this county than in other places where it's a much longer time period for when surface water would percolate, filter down through into that aquifer. So those are things to consider. Um, another thing to consider with using well water is like Pete mentioned, um, it, it's a kind of regulated system in some ways too. So knowing what the flow rate from the well that you're allowed to take is um, and what you can do with that is really important. So we so do it, a little bit less with wells because they are really relatively uncommon in this county in comparison with, uh, or at least with the landowners that, that come to us for assistance, they're really looking at surface water irrigation and surface water rights much more so than wells, um, or that's the primary natural resource concern is with surface irrigation um, with water, with those water rights. So really what you're saying is if you have a commercial enterprise, whether it's crops or animals, and you're going to use irrigation water, the rights have to be deeded to the property. They need to be double checked. Mm -hmm. And I'm noticing that not all the acreage is always included in the irrigation. Like you'll have a, a five acre of irrigation, but you have a 10 acre property. So how is that working? So that's, um, I mentioned in the last segment, the, the term place of use, um, and then also point of diversion. And so when you get your water right and you know you learn point of diversion, that's where in the canal system, basically, you're going to be drawing water from. And it's kind of up to you as an irrigator to manage like from a, from the main canal, say it's an irrigation district's canal or a delivery canal, and you're trying to get it to where you want it on your property. Um, it's your responsibility to then manage the ditches on your property to get it to the place that you're allowed to use it. And so when you get your water right, there should be a, a, a plat, a map that tells you where on the property you can use it. Um, there's a little bit of flexibility in that and a much easier thing to petition from Oregon Water Resource Department is the place of use as long as you're within the same quarter quarter of, <laughs> this is getting kind of complicated, um, but in the, the survey system, um, as long as you're within the same basic like square on the map, say that, holding up my hands trying to give you a picture, here's a square, <laughs> right, and your water right that you're given is down here in this square, but you want to use it over here. 
as long as you're within this broader square, and that's something you have to talk to the water master about doing, you have to petition and get it approved, um, but you can change that. It doesn't mean that you can irrigate both places because you're still going to be given the same amount of water. You still have to make sure that the runoff from that water goes to the person who needs it next because it doesn't stay on your property, right? There are water rights that take basically runoff water from previous irrigators. Um, so you have to make sure that those people get their water. So it's really complicated and just do your do your homework with talking to Oregon Water Resource Department, the water master, come to us for help, um, talk to a water rights examiner, and we can help you navigate that because every situation is different. It's also a pretty simple thing, Alice, because you only get water for so many so many hours over a period of time. You don't get water 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It comes, it's shut off. Every two weeks, you may get it for 72 hours or whatever. You have to be there to water. And, and that's really what you're talking about. It's not really a big issue. As much as it is that the water is delivered to you, you have to be there to use it, and then it goes away. But that's kind of the thing we go. I want to talk about land here because I'm really concerned about what is going on and what if, can the JSWCD, can the public do anything here regarding rehabilitation of lands that have been destroyed? And I want to say destroyed in the quote destroyed with, the, with, with some of the cannabis and hemp farms that have come through here. You can see the fields where they are. They're, some of them are just overgrown. Some have plastic in them. What can be done to help the landowners who lease these properties under good faith that have been destroyed and need to be rehabbed? Is there a way we can do that here or are we just going to have to, are we each on our own? Yeah, you're, you can definitely come to us for both technical and financial assistance. So um, one of the things that we do as a district, in addition to providing really good, I mean, science-based information, but that also takes into consideration your goals and capacity as a landowner, um, is giving you the best recommendations and information about how to put together a management plan that, in this instance, right, brings that area that was in hemp back into kind of a sound sound natural resource management system whatever that is so hey say you want you know you have this like field that's now prepped for annual row crops and you want to put in an orchard or a vineyard or hops or some other kind of product we can help you figure out how to do that um and then we can also help you um Kind of get some a little bit of financial assistance in doing that so depending on the location of the property we have different resources available and different partners who are able to also contribute to that um, one of our strongest partners here in um, really in the whole area of southern oregon is the natural resource conservation service and they're kind of the federal version of what we do at the county level um, but they are able to offer a lot of assistance both in terms of planning and um, if you're kind of within their focus areas, um, they can help out with some of the financing for some of these on-farm improvements that might result from being a hemp property. Um, and I'm thinking really specifically about um, if you purchase a property that the landowner, the previous landowner or the previous lessee put in hemp um, and switched to um, some kind of irrigation system where they're pumping instead of flood irrigating, um, that we can help you maintain that infrastructure um, to make really efficient use of the water with whatever your goals are moving forward. Um, other things that we focus on um, in terms of rehabbing those properties um, would be to turn that field into a better producing pasture than before. Um, that's something that um, we're seeing a lot of these properties here in the valley either uh, were historic permanent patch pastures or they were orchards. Um, but we are working with a number of partners in the valley to transition properties into higher producing pastures, both in terms of the kinds of grasses and other plants that are growing, um, and then also providing really strong pollinator like bee habitat um, to provide that service as well. So with the hemp um, problems that we've had, what, what, is the, what is the most common damage we're seeing from uh, the growers who don't have good practices? Yeah, I think the most common damage um, is, Pete kind of brought it up earlier, but is using uh, plastic row coverings, um, which is something that is very common in annual 
vegetable production. So anywhere else in the country really that you see things like tomatoes, like summer crops being grown, mm -hmm. um, plastic is unfortunately the most common way of controlling weeds. Um, it's not necessarily the most cost effective. Um, you're not really going to save a lot of money by <laughs> installing or removing plastic, which is why we saw so many fields uh, where the plastic didn't come up was because it's so expensive to remove it, um, both in terms of the time that it takes. So it's not just as simple. It's not like a sheet that you just roll up at the end of the season. It gets covered in dirt and weeds and other matter. So it's really hard to pull out and requires specialized equipment to do it properly. Um, and then you can't just dump it in a dumpster and have it taken away just as like normal trash. You actually have to pay the landfill for that amount of material, whether that's, you know, they might come out with a large industrial size dumpster to take it away. Um, but it can cost up to like, I think it's like a hundred dollars um, uh, a square yard depending on the weight, 50 to hundred dollars for the, it might be a little bit high, but um, for the landfill to accept that if it's really dirty material, um, in part because of the weight and it, it can't be reused, so. So um, very expensive damage. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we've got a break coming up, but do not go away because we've got more conversation with Megan Montgomery and Pete Belcaster here. We're talking about hemp, water, soil, Southern Oregon real estate. Do not touch that dial, we'll be right back. Well, welcome back, Southern Oregon, to The Real Estate Show. Alice Lima here with my partner in crime, Pete Belcastro. We're both brokers at John L. Scott, uh, Southern Oregon Real Estate. And we are having a very interesting conversation with Megan Montgomery uh, from uh, Jackson County Soil. Uh, and she's a conservationist. And we're talking about some of the downside of the cannabis and the hemp grows, uh, the little green, the green rush, we were calling it, um, and some of the plastic and just how expensive that really is to use and then uh, to dispose of. Mm -hmm. So Mega, what other uh, kinds of uh, practices could you encourage the hemp and cannabis growers uh, to, uh, to do differently so that it's, it's better, for the, uh, better for everybody? Yeah, so there's a couple of concerns that we have with, um, with hemp grows in the valley and using either using plastic or not, and that is um, how you're protecting the soil um, throughout the year. So I don't know where most of the land new landowners in this county are coming from, but our ecosystem in Southern Oregon um, is very, very hot and very, very dry in the summer and very, very, very rainy in the winter. And so one concern with a lot of properties that grew hemp in last year and in previous years, but primarily last year, was that there was nothing protecting the soil over the winter. Um, and that causes problems both from a natural resource concern and could cause major problems for a property owner in terms of violating um, water quality regulations. So like I said, Jackson Soil and Water, where I am, we are non-regulatory, but we also are here to help landowners avoid getting in trouble with a regulatory agency like the Department of Agriculture. Well, like what, what kind of trouble? What exactly so, are you talking about? So contributing sediment into a water body of the state is what it's called. Um, so a stream, a river, a lake, anything that's connected to the, the broader surface water system. Um, if you are found to be contributing sediment, so topsoil running off the property into a waterway, um, you are violating state water quality rules and you are responsible for solving that problem. One way that you, many ways that you can mitigate that um, is to plant what's called a, a cover crop. Um, and that's basically a winter growing crop um, that holds the soil in place and provides a lot of incredible benefits for soil health at the same time. So you would plant it in some kind of mixture of um, species of grasses, um, of peas or um, clovers, what are called legumes that are really good for building soil health and potentially members of the mustard family. So brassicas um, are really excellent combinations for soil health. And what that does is those root systems basically are like a, a woven blanket on the soil in the winter time and it holds the soil in place. And so you're not contributing those sediments and potentially nutrient leaching to the waterways, um, but you're also holding all of that on the property. And so I'm sure everyone is familiar with what the Dust Bowl was 
um, where you had all of these massive, massive acreages of plowed up fields with nothing holding it on. Um, and then, you know, big storms that blow or wash it all away and you're losing a lot of incredibly nutrient rich, valuable topsoil and you're going to see production really decline over time um, because you don't have the nutrients there. You're not building the soil back up. And then you're also going to see your costs rise because you have to replace those nutrients in some way. And oftentimes, unfortunately, that means purchasing uh, compost is a better alternative, but a lot of people purchase chemical fertilizers, which are not very good for soil health long term. They're really bad for water quality, and they're also really, really expensive and unsustainable. So we really recommend to anyone who is um, managing a field that has been plowed up during the warm season to plant a cover crop. Um, and we can assist with that. We have equipment that you can rent. We can advise you on the exact seed mix, the application rate, the quantities, the costs, the sources, all of those details that um, if you didn't grow up farming, you might not know exactly how to find that information or what the best information is for your situation and for um, the details, the ecological details of the property that you're on. So we can help you with that. Um, in terms of during the growing season, there are some incredible alternatives to plastic. Um, one of those is basic straw mulch, um, which is actually lower in cost to install, uh, to purchase and to install than plastic. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's significantly cheaper. That does and then, that, that work. That, I, I know that you know they're going to say that. They tried that here. Nobody liked it. I saw I talked to several growers who tried it. No way. Nope, yeah, I don't, you know, I actually I don't know. I only know of a couple of growers that did it last year and they had uh, pretty good success with it in terms of weed suppression in comparison with plastic. I've, I've, um, seen, no, I've seen no straw anywhere so far in Jackson County, Josephine County this year. I'm not yeah, and I think that that's because people are counting on their revenues from their hemp products to cover the cost of plastic and it's a little bit easier to navigate the logistics of installing plastic. Um, at, and not to, there's a, a piece of equipment that makes it a little bit easier to use straw and it's called a straw blower um, and it, they use it up in the Willamette Valley very commonly to blow the straw over the property. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of research on trial farms across the west that mulch, this straw mulch suppresses weeds and lowers soil temperature and retains we're almost, right. we're, almost out of, we're almost out of time so we got, we got to kind of wrap this up here. But I think, Alice, what I see is in the last few years is that the farmers who are doing this in both cannabis and hemp, the ones who are remaining, the ones who survived so far, are doing a much better job of managing their lands. The cannabis farms seem to be there. They're, I've been driving by several of them. They, they're, they're well kept. They, they're, they look like they're doing really well. The hemp farms this year look like they're much, much better off. The crops are better. It looks like they've done a better job of managing their lands around them. So let's hope Let's cross our fingers that these folks who are doing this, the farmers who are here now, are going to do what you hope, Megan, which is take care of the land, rotate the crops, make it sustainable so we can continue this wonderful product that we have here and make our economy even more agriculture-wise on these two products that are right now. That's what they are huge. I can't even tell you how many brokers and people I've met coming through our valley buying hemp, buying cannabis, buying all sorts of things as a result of what we're doing here in agriculture. It's a big issue, it's a big, it's a big thing, and I, I'm really glad that you're talking about this and we're getting this information out to people because it's really, really important that we do it right. We must do it right the way we handle our air and water here with hemp and cannabis. Yeah, I think one thing that, the really quick point on that, Pete, sorry, Alice, um, but something that people don't understand is the long-term damage that you can do um, by plowing up a field to plant hemp and you don't have a good plan for it. Um, that's yeah. not something that's undone in one season and it's not cheap and it will impact your property values long term. So. But see, some of that is, is we didn't have farmers doing this it's, it's a, you, you have to know what you're doing. Farming is not an easy thing and you, and you take science. And uh, we're so lucky to have you, Megan. Um, if somebody wants more information or to get a hold of you or your agency, how would they reach out? Okay. Um, so we have a website. It is jswcd.org. Um, you can go on there and find contact information for all of our staff. We have specialists in irrigation engineering. I'm an agriculture specialist. We have a forestry, wildlife habitat, wildfire, and riparian specialist. 
Um, we have an urban water conservation specialist, and we also have a community education specialist. So um, we are really like a powerhouse wealth of information, and we're also very well connected in the Valley to agencies and other organizations that can address your concerns as well. Um, and then another service that we offer free of cost to all landowners in the county are basically free property consultations. So you can call us up, um, get a hold of whichever specific staff member, schedule a site visit, we'll come out and walk your property with you, point out things that we see that you should be concerned about and talk about your goals and help you come up with a plan. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, Megan. We appreciate you so much. Pete, we'll be back again next week at the same time. There'll also be a repeat of this show tomorrow at 6 p.m. Thank you for listening, Southern Oregon. Pete Belcastro, Alice Lima, and Megan Montgomery saying have a beautiful weekend and we'll talk to you again soon. Yep. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye.